Welcome to today's webinar, USP General Chapters and Compounded Preparation Monographs, Best Practices and Regulatory Guidance is presented by Eric Tosh and Rod Hazelhorst with Letco Medical. Eric Tosh is VP Compounding Support Services. He has led the Letco Medical Professional Services team since it was established in December 2000. Eric's pharmacy career spans over 28 years. He is also an adjunct faculty member of the, universe, of the Western University College of Pharmacy, where he teaches compounding. He has published articles in the International Journal of Pharmaceutical Compounding and a chapter contributor to Remington Science and Practice of Pharmacy, 22nd edition. Eric served on the International Academy of Compounding Pharmacists, IACP Board of Directors, is a past president, and serves as 2019 Chairman of the Board. Rod Hazelhorst is a pharmacist in Letco Medical Professional Services Department. Rod is a 1997 graduate of St. Louis College of Pharmacy and worked at BJC Healthcare while he was a pharmacy student where he did an extensive amount of sterile compounding. After graduating, Rod was a consultant pharmacist, operations pharmacist, and director of operations for Omnicare, a long-term care pharmacy provider. Rod continued to compound and entered a partnership to open a compounding pharmacy called Glen Ed Pharmacy, where they dispensed both sterile and non-sterile prescriptions. From workflow design to marketing to formulation development, Rod was a driving force in the success of his pharmacy. Today's webinar is accredited through ACPE and is worth one CE credit hour. CE credit is applied following completion of an evaluation found in the presentation handout. You can find the handout on the lower portion of the GoToWebinar toolbox under Handouts. We are recording this session and will include the recording and evaluation link in a follow-up email. Questions may be submitted throughout the webinar using the GoToWebinar toolbox on the right side of your screen under the Questions tab. We will answer the questions submitted following the presentation. If we do not get to your question today, a list of questions and answers will be emailed to all attendees following the webinar. Thank you for joining today's session. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located. This is Eric Tosh. Uh, it's a pleasure working with you all. Um, we are, as noted, going to be talking about the USP, its chapters, uh, format, how it's used for providing information on best practices, and on, from a compliance and regulatory standpoint, this will not be a deep dive into specific chapters. I do want to make a note at this point that neither Rod or I have any conflicts of interest to declare. And usual information on continuing education, I do want to thank ARL as a sponsor on this program, the American College of Apothecaries, uh, for their accreditation on, on this program and others that they've done. With this program, our goal is really to look at, again, sort of at what I'll call the 30,000-foot level, how USP um, puts together the chapters, or, you know, sort of the, the general concept of uh, best practices, whether we're talking current good compounding practices or current good manufacturing practices. We'll use a few highlighted chapters uh, that are relevant to our compounding peers, uh, whether in a hospital setting or in a traditional pharmacy setting or, you know, potentially even in a 503B, there is some overlap in the outsourcing facility, depending on whether the state board's looking at this. We're going to look at broadly the entire USP. Sometimes we forget that there are other components, so we're going to look at general notices, a couple of examples of uh, why you need to know about general notices. We'll look at the compounding monographs that uh, USP has published and a couple of examples of those. And really look at how USP is used from what we'll call the as an enforcement document and how it got to be an enforcement document. You know, just a little background, USP is a .org. Think of this in, in a couple of different ways. You've got .govs, those are people with badges, whether it's a state or federal agency. Uh, those are the folks who come in and, and, if you will, enforce or apply a regulatory standard to what we do. Uh, USP has been historically, and it is a, a .org, they're a, uh, essentially an organization that going way back to their founding was there to present and create uh, the, the standardization, uh, and we'll go way back. How do you extract and use foxglove to treat congestive heart failure? There were monographs for digitalis leaf. Obviously, over a 
couple hundred years, we've, uh, you know, our science has progressed, we do more. And so USP is always trying to stay in the forefront and providing uh, best practices, if you will. Um, but one thing that we tend to forget about as compounders is we get very narrow in our focus oftentimes and just look at a particular chapter. Uh, and again, we tend to think of 795 for the non-sterile or 797 for the sterile. You have to look at everything. And we're going to give you some examples of what front matter is in the uh, USP. I would certainly encourage folks to, uh, if you don't, and this is, you know, I guess the only conflict of interest is I don't work for USP, but I sure encourage you to uh, have a subscription or buy the USP. There is so much relevant information that helps you develop your SOPs and ensure that you're staying on top of what needs to go on. If we have any state board people on, um, be aware that, that these are standards of practice, what are considered best practices, but in a particular state, a particular part of a chapter, all that may not apply. There may be reasons why a state board would want to look and make modifications and not just adopt the chapter outright. Um, but again, that ends up being a, uh, a state-specific issue. So why do you need to read all this? Well, in 1938, when the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed, part of that was the incorporation of USPNF standards uh, as guidance for enforcement. So historically, that's been FDA on the pharma, the good, uh, the current good manufacturing practice side, um, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit later about the uh, the the passage of the what was essentially established OSHA and how that applies at a federal level. Most of us have been practicing any length of time. We're you know clearly used to our board of pharmacy regulating us. And boards of pharmacy will, you know, do things like adopt the entire USP. Probably not the most prudent thing because there are parts of USP that probably don't apply to compounding practice. Uh, there are others that don't reference USP at all or build their own version. So state boards of pharmacy look to USP for guidance on how to uh, incorporate and, and encourage best practices just broadly in pharmacy practice as well as specific compounding. Tied to the OSHA and the federal agencies, uh, again, with 800, and we'll talk about that in a bit from a regulatory compliance standpoint, are state OSHAs. There is, in fact, a, for lack of better terms, a memorandum of understanding where states follow and look at what OSHA guidelines are for workplace safety and uh, agree to use those same standards within their state. And, um, and again, we'll talk about some examples of that as we get into this. So the reason you need to read all this is it's being used by regulatory bodies. I like to think of USP is really set up in functional tiers. The front matter, general notices, your definitions, terminology really is the foundation and the starting point for everything we do when we're developing our, our practice of pharmacy, especially compounding. Built on that are the general chapters, uh, your API monographs, and then sort of at the peak of this, since our discussion is really around compounding, are, there are compounding specific monographs, or compounded preparation monographs, and we've got a couple of examples of those as we get into this. General notices. Uh, I've listed seven here. We'll give three as an example. Uh, and I, I've pulled some text. Now, I will also say that when we get into 795, 7800, uh, what I've got are the, uh, the, the chapters will be going in effect and not yet official. And I should point out that in the uh, format and structure of USP, they have what are considered their, their official matter uh, as of whatever date, and then they'll have the not yet official information. And there's typically a date tied to when that particular monograph or that section goes into effect. And so the recently released 795 and 797 um, they go into effect December 1st are considered not yet official, gives us time to look at them and make, and make sure that we've got our uh, operational practices or SOPs aligned with the chapters when they go into effect. Everything I refer to specifically to the chapters is from the not yet official parts when we talk about 795 and 7 as opposed to what's currently official. So you, you, know, you may be working under one set of conditions right now and I may be talking about a future state um, just understand that we're talking about the not yet official portions. So when we look at the general notices, uh, we want to talk about these first three applicable applicability of standards, test procedures, and, com and then the compounded preparations, because they do give guidance on how we apply 
uh, this broader information to our SOPs and our work practices, and also how a state board or a federal agency might look at what we're doing. So with the first one as an example, uh, applicability of standards, you know, this is my bold, um, but notice here, the standards in the relevant monograph chapters and journal notices apply at all times in the life of the article from production to expiration. So understand what's in the journal notices applies every bit as much as a specific chapter may apply or an API monograph. Uh, and then again, just a second bullet, I'm not going to read through all of these. There's a lot of material here and you can read these when you download this. Uh, but the point is, is what's in that official article in order to make a statement that you've got an official USP preparation or an, uh, a compounded preparation or that the API is an official USP uh, monographed API, you have to meet uh, all the reference uh, tests and, and standards that are listed. For applicability of test procedures, sometimes folks say, well, which is the most important test to do? And, and there's sort of a general view, one that I certainly came and approach, um, but the general notices addresses the order that tests are listed in a monograph or the order in which they were approved by the expert committee. Uh, just a quick discussion about expert committees. With each of these areas of the USP, they will put together expert committees that serve typically on a five-year term. There's a nomination process. People, people can put their name in the hat and uh, then, um, depending on the vetting process, will be assigned to the expert committee. So you may have microbiologists. You may have uh, you know, facility engineer experts. You know, so they're, the USP is great at reaching out to a broad range of experts, subject matter experts, and put these committees together to then address particular components of USP chapters or uh, chemical monographs, whatever it may be. But again, the order that they're listed, and this is straight out of uh, 41010, is this is the order in which they were approved. Certainly, one can take the view that. They're going to approve the, the first test list is the one that they probably thought most important, but the idea here is the, the order they're listed is in the order in which they were approved by the expert committee. In compounded preparations, uh, again, this is there's more. This is just one of the bullets. And this really talks about um, one of the things, and we'll have a little bit of discussion on this a little bit later on with 795 discussion. Uh, one of the questions that commonly comes up, and again, you need to address this in your SOPs, this becomes a practice issue, if you will, a regulatory compliance issue. Accrediting bodies like PCAB or Joint Commission will look at this. On an API monograph, for instance, there'll be a reference to either uh, the analysis was done on a dried basis. If you'll note here, it says that you don't have to necessarily dry the chemical. You just have to uh, make sure that you account for that moisture or those volatile substances. And it may be that you don't necessarily have to do the math. Let's say the, uh, the allowance is 0.2% maximum uh, uh, on your moisture content. You may have in your SOP that as long as it's less than 0.2%, um, you don't do the math for that calculation, but you must include within your SOPs when you do calculations, why you do them, and what part of the C of A uh, you go to, because this is something that certainly the accrediting bodies like PCAB and Joint Commission are starting to look at, and then certainly state boards, uh, some are, are looking at this and you, when you get into your master formulation, how are you accounting for these assay variations and uh, moisture content, whatever it may be. So again, the general notices, we talked about this is all applicable, gives you guidance on what to do. So make sure that you look at that in addition to any of the information in the chapter. We're going to move on into some examples in 795, 7800, uh, and where, you know, again, we've pulled some examples out uh, to give you an idea of how you want to consider this for your uh, best practices and how an enforcement body might consider this. One thing that was very nice when the new chapters came out uh, that go into effect in December, USP provided links to download the new chapters, 795 and 797. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, go through the USP website. Uh, you should be able to utilize these links and um, put in to get those chapters so you can start to compare them. Um, but understand there is more material that you need to be aware of than just these two chapters. Um, so uh, you really do need to have access to the full USP. 
to help speed up the process when these new chapters came out, USB also provided links to their FAQs. Strongly encourage you to look at these FAQs. Um, provide some great information. Uh, we all tend to have similar questions and like to ask USP, uh, you know, what do I do about X? Classic one under USP 800, I think it may be question 54, kind of use hormone concentrates outside the hood. Under their definitions of what, uh, what is considered an API, um, USP does not consider hormone concentrates um, a finished compound of preparation. And so reading through 800, one would have to continue to use that hormone concentrate under a containment uh, system until you've got the finished preparation done. So I strongly encourage you to look at the, at the FAQs because they help guide you, write your SOPs, and help guide uh, certainly the accrediting bodies to make sure you're following um, either your state boards, Practice Act, the uh, accreditation bodies, uh, considerations, what they're looking for when they come in. Under 795, uh, it was just released, and this really applies to 795, 7, and 800. The effective date for these chapters is all December 1st. So again, the current chapter is what you operate under. But start realigning your SOPs and practices to what the new chapter is going to call for. A couple of things we're going to talk about uh, in 795. Again, this is not to do a deep dive. Uh, we can spend probably an entire day talking about each of these chapters and, and where they are currently and where they're going in a future state. But I do want to talk about a few components here, and we'll highlight some. So we'll talk a little bit about BUDs, talk a little bit about the compounding area and how it's described in the not official yet 795, the master formulation record. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, I've highlighted here the water activity, chapter 1112. Chapters numbered above 1,000 are informational. Chapters below 1,000 by statute are enforceable. So typically what USP does is if they're going to introduce a new concept, such as water activity into compounding, uh, they will introduce it as a chapter over 1,000. Uh, and it's actually a, a, rail, a range between chapters 1,000 and 2,000 are the informational. And over a period of whether it's one year, two years, uh, they will provide updates, get feedback from practitioners and industry, make modifications, and then generally will then reintroduce that chapter as a sub-1000 chapter. So uh, just recognize when you see the references to water activity and the BUDs, this is to give guidance on the microbiological uh, preservative system and how we're looking at water as a, uh, a growth promoter and how you consider that in establishing your BUD. Um, and uh, we'll, so again, look at that, understand it, it gives you some guidance. Um, I would encourage boards of pharmacy and certainly pharmacists on this call to work with your boards of pharmacy to recognize this is informational at this point. It helps provide some framework for how one establishes their extended BUDs on, on uh, non-sterile preparations that contain water. I did do a cut and paste just to show uh, some changes, for those of you who are familiar with the current 795, this is slightly different with the uh, not yet official chapter. They have broken out some things, so you've got uh, some differences between non-preserved aqueous preparations, preserved aqueous preparations, non-aqueous dosage forms. So this would be things like trochies, suppositories, and your oral solid dosage forms. Uh, so these are the, the, the dates that are uh, recommended, or not recommended, but in the BUD section. 0795 uh, gives a temperature range. Again, go back to general notices, and that tells you what refrigerator temperature range should be, what a control room temperature is. That's, again, in the definitions in the front matter. So this is all uh, updated from where we currently practice. It gives you, you'll notice that I think some of the older ones, uh, versions had 30 days. Now you've got 35. But again, you need to understand fundamentally uh, what's going on and um, you know, make those changes. And, and consider how you get there. As always, if you have a component in, a, in your formula that's got a shorter date, you have to go with the shorter date. So if the API is going to expire in 45 days and you're making a capsule, you cannot assign 180 days. You have to go with the shorter date. So those things haven't changed. Again, don't, not going to get into the weeds on the BUD discussion here, but this is straight from the, uh, the newer 795 that goes into, for, into effect. So you can start thinking about how you need to change your SOPs and your master formula. 
There is discussion in 795 about extending BUDs. It's certainly been a hot topic uh, over the years. Um, back when I started, everything was sort of done as potency over time. But the real gold standard, and I've highlighted here, is using a stability indicating assay for the API, the compounded non serial preparation, container closures, all that has to be accounted for. Uh, some people call it the forest degradation study, the, whatever terminology. If you're doing something and you want to get past these uh, BUDs that are established in the chapter, do an extended BUD, you must have a very robust, rigorous, validated study. Um, so certainly some of the third party extended BUD studies are on the market uh, that compounders are using. Go back and look at those very carefully. Make sure that every one of these things has been accounted for um, because you may find that that study, certainly we know practically it, you know, the product is good, but if you haven't accounted for all of this properly, that may not in fact be a valid extended BUD study. The other piece of this, again, it's just a cut and paste, uh, so you'll need to go back and look at it. The antimicrobial effectiveness testing, this really ties in similarly to the chapter 11, 12 on water activity. One of the things that affects stability, we know hydrolysis can lead to chemical instability, but the other part of that is a microbial uh, content. So creams that contain water are standard oil and water emulsions. Um, if you're going to do an extended BUD, you must do antimicrobial, effective, antimicrobial effectiveness testing on the preservative system. Is that system going to hold up and prevent microbial growth within that cream? So there's something, and you'll notice here, that's chapter 51, so that's an enforceable chapter. Again, a reason why you need to have more than just chapter 795. You need to have access to the full USP so you can go through and read what these requirements are and how one goes about doing the testing. Another area that if some of you saw the draft 795 that came out that was uh, a little bit of a change with the final uh, version that came out that make reference to a defined compounding area. Um, I think there was some concern that this meant you had to have a completely separate lab walled off access. Read through it, make sure you understand that this is my paraphrasing. Um, but as I, as I read it and went back and reread it again this morning, um, the compounding area must be defined. You need to have a perimeter. But one of the things that they note in there is that no other activity can take place in that area while compounding is going on. So, you know, that does provide a little broader for the smaller compounding operation where you've got a small lab and you may need to do other activities uh, in that same footprint. Um, this would certainly suggest you can do that, but you have to be very clear in your SOPs that the that when someone's back making capsules or they're back making a cream, can have someone standing there beside them um, organizing the hard copy prescriptions and putting them in a file folder. Uh, you know, the when compounding's going on, that's all that can be going on. Uh, so again, read through that chapter, make sure you understand in the in the uh, soon to be official 795 the distinctions they make about your compounding area and what you can do. Another area that was in the draft version talked about manipulating APIs inside a powder containment enclosure of some sort. The chapter that finally came out, uh, in fact, changes that language up a little bit. Risk assessment should be done. Doesn't define what that risk assessment is. I would certainly encourage you to sit and, and think about if you're working with a, um, a powder, a non-hazardous powder, something that's not on the NIOSH list, you may still want to have just blanket every powder managed inside a powder containment enclosure. Uh, you may have, and they describe what meets the, the right um, functional aspects of powder containment within the chapter, the types of uh, what we call balanced enclosure, powder containment hood. They outline what you should use in that. But you may want to look at the SDS. So as an example, ketoprofen. If you look at ketoprofen, anyone who's worked with it, uh, making a topical ketoprofen cream. Um, if you breathe that powder in, it will take your breath away. Um, so that might be one that while it's not on the NIOSH list, you would designate that needs to be inside a powder containment hood. Something else, maybe not. So again, you've got some flexibility, but you must do the risk assessment, provide criteria what that risk assessment is, because I can assure you state boards are going to look at this, uh, regulatory bodies are going to look at it, and you need to consider uh, within your practice and how you apply seven, the new 795 
to your policies and procedures and moving forward. I'm not going to go through all the bullets on the master formula record. I will make a couple of comments here. 795 or 797, the new chapter does also address master formulation record. 800 in and of itself does not specifically talk about master formulation record, but if you look within 800 at reference to the NIOSH hazardous drug list, uh, there's a table toward when the new drug list comes out, it should be out this fall. Um, at the toward the very end, I want to say it's table five. The uh, NIOSH, since they first came out with this list in 2004, provide a great grid of if you're doing X process, you need to wear Y personal protective equipment or in Z uh, facility containment engineering control. So certainly I would encourage you on your master formula records, especially those that you get from a third party supplier, third party vendor, typically those master formula records are templates. They don't address the type of equipment that you use. You'll notice that uh, this provides in this fourth bullet uh, you have to have instructions in your master formula on how to, what equipment to use, what supplies. So I, most of the templates I've seen that are out there don't really drill down to every possible equipment permutation. So you'll need to take that template you have from a third party supplier and make sure you uh, provide all these components that are listed. We'll go through the next couple of slides. Uh, again, what my highlighting reference source for your assigned BUD make sure you include that in your master formula record. Uh, again, we talked about calculations. There's a great webinar that ARL has uh, that you, how to use the USP monographs to account for salt ester conversions, uh, you know, what to do for moisture content in your calculations. So I would certainly refer you to that webinar or other information on how you utilize the uh, certificates of analysis, these API monographs, within your master formula record and your SOPs to account for applicable calculations. Again, we know that PCAB uh, slash ACHC Joint Commission is looking at those sorts of things when they're doing their accreditations, as well as state boards. And the last bit of this, how the master, and this is all straight from the uh, new, new 795. This is all just straight cut and paste. So again, need to go back and look at the full chapter and understand what's required, but you'll probably need to make some updates uh, in your uh, master formula to make sure you've got all these covered. Moving on in 797, uh, a couple of revisions of note. Uh, they've moved sterile hazardous drug information to chapter 800. We've got a, a nuclear pharmacist on the call. You've got your own chapter now, eight, uh, 825. Uh, some revisions in the BED process and they've aligned the pressure differentials uh, in 797 to match what's in 800. Just kind of quickly talking about the BUDs because there's a great deal of detail here. Um, the updated BUDs um, changed how you, how you assess, you know, the old low, medium, high risk compounded sterile preparation versus now category one, category two, dating. Um, again, rather than try and lay out three or four slides worth of the permutations of how you get to your BUD, uh, it really varies significantly depending on the method and the components. So you'll have to look at your current SOPs, uh, your current practices, what you need to do to update them. But these BUDs can range anywhere from one day to 90 days, depending on whether at room temperature, how they were processed, where they were processed, uh, where that compounding took place. So again, make sure you look at it. An area of discussion that's come up, again, it's you know one that um, is a little bit unusual. Uh, you saw in 795 a reference to stability indicated method tests for extending your BUD. Um, that is not explicitly listed in 797. There is a definition difference given between expiration dates and BUDs, and under the expiration dates, reference to manufacturers and what they do to arrive at these longer dates. That is the same thing one would do, um, for instance, in the 795 non sterile extended BUD, it's those stability indicating methods where you account for all aspects of the process. Uh, certainly a lot of folks have done some very good robust studies that would provide for better dating than what the 797 provides for. As it's currently written, uh, there's a good bit of debate about whether those can be used or not. Certainly the science uh, and the historical use of science would absolutely uh, Im imply that one could extend the BUD. The way 797 has been presented, um, pretty locked down to these dates. Uh, so again, you need to work with your state board of pharmacy if you're a compounder 
uh, understand some of the uh, historical use of science, perhaps talk to one of your labs that you work with, get their perspective. Um, they can certainly help educate your, you as well as your state board perhaps on the, the science of how one goes about extending BUDs and, and the appropriateness of doing uh, the stability indicating tests to uh, get a date out beyond uh, what's listed in the 797. But please note that under DQSA, the 503A makes very, um, you know, part of your practice and, and maintaining your 503A exemption is you're following state board and uh, other related um, practice guidelines, which this would certainly imply. So it, uh, the prudent, most conservative course is you stick to these dates uh, unless you can demonstrate um, science otherwise. 800, a little bit of a departure for USP uh, up to the, the uh, publication of USP 800. We've always looked at how do we practice pharmacy, essentially for patient safety. How are we, what do we do to ensure the highest quality manufacturing product, the highest quality compound preparation? What are those practices that ensure patient safety and uh, that the what we're doing is going to be clinically effective and safe? USP 800, and this is really you know, I'll put on my hat here, uh, you know, in my interpretation, I have an OSHA background prior to being in pharmacy. Um, I really view USP 800 has nothing to do with traditional pharmacy practice. It's plain and simple workplace safety standard. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, just the approach is a little different. Uh, I will certainly touch on enforcement may include OSHA, but include state OSHA. If you're in a state that has adopted USP 800, your state would be looking at this. Another consideration, will FDA consider 503 exemption la uh, language. If you are not USP 800 compliant, it's a chapter numbered under 1000. Uh, if you're in a pharmacy and you're compounding progesterone and HRT products and you're not following 800 uh, the way it's laid out, would is it possible FDA would pull the 503A exemption under DQSA? Remains to be seen, but it's something to consider and certainly encourage those of you who are on the fence uh, to look at 800. Uh, not as a uh, an impediment to compounding, it's just something that we need to do to protect our, ourselves and our employees. Um, so again, this is something that is uh, not related to the traditional pharmacy practice the way we normally think of it as a workplace safety issue. A key reason, a key thing to keep in mind, failure to adopt and use this is uh, could lead to some significant fines I've provided a couple of links here to the OSHA page. Um, depending on what the finding is and how one approach is approached, you can be looking at anywhere from a 13,000, it's a little over $13,000 per day to $130,000 per day fine for failure to comply with workplace safety guidelines. So if you work at uh, aluminum smelting plant and you're not protecting your workers from exposure to aluminum fumes that cause an Alzheimer's-like disease, OSHA is going to get you. If you're in a paint and body shop and you're exposing your employees to volatile uh, solvents that are hard on the liver and you're not providing the uh, respiratory protection, you can bet OSHA is going to get involved. OSHA's had the ability to come into a pharmacy from a workplace safety standpoint at any time since they were founded. Certainly with the initiation of NIOSH 2004 hazardous drug list, OSHA could have come in. There's at least one case in 1996 where NIOSH, not OSHA, but NIOSH, went in after complaints from uh, employees of an outpatient oncology clinic, uh, respiratory irritation, and found evidence of a spill where the uh, chemo drug had been tracked all the way out to the patient waiting area. So there is certainly some precedent for NIOSH to come in and do an investigation. Uh, certainly once uh, USB 800 goes into effect, it is certainly possible you would see either OSHA or state OSHA come in. And I included this bottom bullet. Over half the states have an agreement with OSHA to parallel their enforcement and fines. So I would encourage you to take a look at that and understand the implications that would bring to you if you are not compliant with 800. Whether, you know, again, this is not so much the actual oversight, but just to, you know, a little bit of brief divergence. Where could a complaint come from? You know, if you're on this phone and you're 800 compliant, you've got three competitors that aren't and they're cutting your price in half. You can bet that someone out there is going to call uh, out their competitors that aren't compliant. Disgruntled employees. Uh, we see this in other industries. An employee is disgruntled, so they call OSHA or Cal OSHA 
or Illinois OSHA because they're mad at their boss. Um, I've seen concerned citizens. This happened in my own practice. We had a photo lab and one of our customers, uh, never found out who, was absolutely convinced we were dumping photochemicals down the sewage. Um, 90 days after they put the monitors in place, EPA came in and said, oh, we've been monitoring your effluent. Um, great news, you weren't dumping chemicals down the drain. And we're like, well, yeah, that's true, we weren't. So it's certainly possible a concerned citizen that is aware of 800 and workplace safety uh, it could decide that they're, they're going to take it upon themselves to uh, make sure you're taking care of your staff. And lastly, the good old 10 o'clock at night where you exposed to asbestos, call us and we'll get you the money you deserve. Um, don't be fooled. There are probably attorneys who are well aware of 800 and the implications. Uh, so just keep in mind, this is really to do the right thing, take care of your staff. And if you don't, these are some of the areas where you could find yourself a foul. So USP provides us some great guidance on how to have our best practices, whether it's standard pharmacy practice or workplace safety in the case of 800. At this point, I'm going to hand off to Rod. Thanks, Eric. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to deviate away from the compliance aspect for a little bit that Eric has been addressing and, and speak a little bit more to the operational impact that this would be, uh, that you would potentially be experienced with this currently, getting your rooms ready, uh, planning to get them ready, or you know, hopefully wrapping up and, and uh, approaching completion here. Uh, as the slide states, the timeline to get ready is now. Uh, we're going, the effective date for this is 12-1 of 19, so we're a little over five months. Uh, there will be some uh, disruptions along the way just due to suppliers, et cetera. But what I want to do is just take a, a few minutes and just kind of go into the basics of what we're looking at here how it's going to impact your room. For those of you who may not have read the regulations or FAQ, just kind of give a quick Reader's Digest version of what the general impact is of this on your day-to-day -day operation. So basically what we're looking at is now having to, for items classified as uh, hazardous on the NIOSH list, is operating within a negative pressure room that is separate from your other compounding space. Hard-walled room, we can't do soft walls. Uh, that is negative uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 inches of water column to the adjacent space. So it will always be uh, exhausting this room to the outside. It will be a negative environment as compared to, say, your traditional sterile lab, which is more of a positive. Um, general room ideas that we're seeing folks work with is retrofitting existing workspace. If they uh, had space available in their current compounding lab or storage rooms, et cetera, uh, looking at utilizing those, um, and the other option being a modular room. Regardless of what direction you go, um, you need to meet the basic criteria for what's laid out in USP 800. And what that states is that the surfaces, all the surfaces of your ceiling, your walls, your floors, your fixtures, your shelving units, counters, cabinets, et cetera, everything that falls into that classification, everything within your hazardous drug room has to be smooth, has to be impervious, free from cracks and crevices, and non-shedding. So that lays out a pretty narrow window of what we're gonna be able to have in our hazardous drug rooms just to be able to provide for adequate cleaning. Um, so with that being said, obviously operational considerations is if we're looking at repurposing a space, it may be cheaper up front, but how is that construction dust and debris and delays, et cetera, gonna impact us in our day-to-day -day operation as we as we're operating today and going forward for the coming weeks while that may occur. Uh, the other option, modular rooms. Certainly is very neat, very clean. Uh, it's going to meet the requirements of what the regulation states that it needs to. Uh, maybe a little bit more of an upfront cost, but in the long run, and the, the lack of disruption to your facility may be something that is interesting for some of the pharmacy owners picks out there as well in their decision making. Whichever direction you go, uh, again, the time to start planning, if not already started, is now. Uh, we will see, and as the slide states when we're focusing on equipment, uh, whether it's hoods, whether it's balances, other equipment that would be needed within your hazardous drug room, because we're looking at duplicating the equipment from the non-hazardous side to the hazardous side, we are seeing some delays from the manufacturers at times now running out to three or four months. Uh, depending on what the equipment is, sometimes we can still get them quicker. So. But I think it's pretty easy to forecast as we get closer to the effective date that these delays will not become shorter. They will only continue to grow. So again, keep that in mind if you're looking at modular. Give yourself ample time for construction, delivery, assembly, et cetera. Hoods, 
same deal. They need to be constructed. The, the manufacturers do not have huge inventories just sitting in a warehouse. So that's something we need to be aware of. The other piece, which if you are on top of your plan and you have everything together, is then ultimately getting your room certified. There could be a backlog of uh, on the calendar of just of physically getting somebody into your building who's going to be able to certify your room. Uh, a lot of challenge is challenges that we hear from pharmacies across the country is, is who can certify my room. So uh, working through your, your peers, your network to find out who they have used to certify their other lab equipment or their sterile lab, et cetera. Uh, you need to reach out to your, you know, your uh, other compounding pharmacies in your area to see who they've used and, and make sure you can get somebody lined up to certify your room so you don't have a big delay from when the room's completed to when it's actually certified. So those services are limited. Uh, it will begin to backlog as well, just like it would be for the equipment. The other piece of it, and this isn't necessarily the, the doom and gloom piece of it, is there will be opportunities that arise from this as well. Um, in speaking with pharmacies across the country, you know, there's folks who will decide not to do these changes and exit the hazardous, hazardous component of compounding or exit compounding in general. What happens to those scripts? Who's going to be able to fill that void? So positioning yourself to be able to capture those scripts and, and keep them in your local community instead of going elsewhere. So it's going to make, you know, you need to work with your staff to make sure you're communicating with your prescribers or if there's pharmacies that are not making the changes, you know, what sort of a plan could be hashed out to, to make sure those patients don't have any disruption in their therapy. And the other piece of it is, is with 800, it applies to every, everybody handling hazardous drugs. So it could be veterinary clinics, physicians offices. Currently, you could have a vet practice down the road from you um, making some of the items that are classed that will be on uh, the hazardous drug list. If they do not take the appropriate precautions to prepare their lab, uh, they're not going to be able to to do that. So, you know, coordinating with those folks to let them know what services you offer, that you've done the proper build out, that your room is in compliance, and you're able to take care of all their needs for their animal or human patients. Just wanted to remind folks, we do have questions coming in. Continue to send those across. Uh, time permitting here at the end of the program, we will address those. Whatever we can't address on the call, we will address in a follow-up FAQ document. I'm going to turn it back over to Eric now for some additional information on API monographs. All right. Thank you, Rod. And we will, so we can try to get to at least a couple of key questions at the end. I, I will go through these. I think most everybody's familiar with some of these concepts. And again, from a regulatory from a compliance best practice standpoint. Looking at the API monographs, you know, USP puts these together and really this is to provide, you know, a standard set of tests and means for ensuring that progesterone is progesterone, that progesterone is not hydroxyprogesterone capoate. Those are different tests, those are different molecules. So the great thing is USP over, you know, the decades has developed very good, robust tests to identify and confirm that what's in that jug or that bottle or that bag is what you think it's going to be, and also provides for the, inter, if you will, the interchangeability. So if you've got a master formula, you're going to make a preparation, your regular supplier, for whatever reason, there's a supply chain disruption, uh, and you need to get your progesterone from a different place or your mesimazole from a different place, you can be assured that the the API is what you need for your compound of preparation. So this the, these API monographs provide the testing that's needed. And certainly, um, you know, we'll go into this a little bit more, uh, the, you know, how it's utilized at the manufacturer level, the repack level, the end user level. Another comment, this is just sort of a, a general comment, um, don't have a timeline on this, we're aware of the United States Pharmacopeia, there's a European Pharmacopeia, EP, JP for Japan, BP for Britain, or the British Pharmacopeia. There is, a, in the background, a global harmonization effort going on to align these monographs, these various, um, particularly the API monographs, so they're all doing the same heavy metal test or doing the same, uh, either, you know, you have multiple options for identification or everybody's doing the same ID test but really bring everything into alignment. So we have a one global set of standards. Since the uh, USP operates in five-year cycles, uh, I don't know whether it'll be in the next five-year cycle, whether it'll be 
10 years from now, but understand that USP works closely with other pharmacopoeia around the world to ensure that from, you know, if you will, our chemicals don't have borders. We can be assured that progesterone will always be progesterone. At the uh, more granular level, the original manufacturer, in order to label chemical XYZ as USP, they must do uh, everything that's listed in that, in that monograph in terms of tests and uh, demonstrate that it meets all those requirements. Uh, also, these uh, API monographs are used by repackagers, uh, other intermediate users, to confirm that what they got from the supplier is what they were expecting. And then we see more and more pharmacies uh, getting sophisticated. Price points are coming down. I know of a number of pharmacies that have their own HPLC machine and have their own QC lab. So this gives the end user the ability to look at what uh, USP is identified as uh, the proper, proper test uh, to confirm you've got the right thing in the jug and match that up and validate what you're getting uh, through the supply chain. So these API monographs are essential in, in making sure that you've got the right thing in the jug. Um, again, talked about this a little earlier, provides a number of things you can do um, in terms of calculations in your formula, won't belabor this. Um, there are some implications on the API monographs that really kind of tie back to the global harmonization. If you look at Drug Quality and Security Act, divides out 503A and B. Uh, there's some uh, criteria that A must follow for compounding. One of them is USP, monogra USP and F monographed APIs. FDA does not consider dietary supplement monographs uh, to be the equivalent. Um, certainly there's other efforts going on to address that, but as it stands, uh, FDA only recognizes the API monographs USP puts out, not the dietary supplements. 503B language is slightly different, says USB and F or equivalent, which would imply that they, a 503B could use a BP or EP chemical. Uh, again, not going to do a real deep dive on DQSA. Just be aware from a compliance or regulatory standpoint, if you're a state board, understand some of these differences and make sure that when you're adopting rules or putting them in place, uh, they're not overly, overly burdensome or provide uh, an area of confusion where folks are not sure what they're supposed to be doing. Talk about the API monographs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that here. Just understand that uh, it is going on. Moving into compounded preparations, the last two are just examples of compounded preparation monographs um, that we'll show. The nice thing is USP has done some outstanding um, stability indicating method, what we would just call robust stability tests to develop, uh, I think it's around 120, 121 compounded monographs. Uh, if you follow that monograph, you can use that extended BUD dating. I'll give you a couple, we'll have a couple of examples here and, and where you have to look at what the requirements are. These are both for human and vet. Um, so again, you know, they don't call, some of them are called vet, some are obvious if it's uh, an active and almond oil, those are almost always um, a vet preparation. Again, they have robust studies to extend those dates. Um, there are a couple of key things to consider about the extended BUDs. It's really functionally tied to the preservative system. Um, and in this first one, we'll show you the atenolol. Uh, you'll note here, uh, here's your atenolol. It gives you the label range, not less than 90 or 110, pretty much what we're used to seeing with finished preparations. It's a two milligram per mil. But notice here it says atenolol. It doesn't say atenolol from company A, company B, company C. Just says atenolol, same thing with glycerin, doesn't specify a manufacturer. What, they're, what it does have to be here is glycerin USB and atenolol USB. Um, you'll notice down here in the instructions, makes reference to the vehicle for oral suspension, vehicle for oral solution sugar free. If you go to those, then there is a USB monograph on how to prepare that. Uh, and that is where your preservative is, and that's what really provides the stability. USP has done a great job, as I noted, in identifying the, the guardrails you have to stay within to use those ex extended BUDs, the packaging and labeling. And I apologize uh, in my attempt to highlight, I actually blobbed out beyond you state here is not more than 60 days. Um, and we'll get an updated set of slides that uh, has not had this operator error. So again, my apologies, but the second part of the atenolol indicates how they got to it, the labeling, beyond use state, sorted controlled room temperature, and so on. 
who was the uh, member within USP who put together the information if you've got questions to email. Um, so again, this is great because it provides uh, not only how to make it, but any test methods that need to be done to confirm you've got the right thing. The next example goes, you know, provides some of those narrower guardrails. This is lisinopril compound of preparation. You'll note here a couple of, uh, and I apologize for the fine print and eye chart, um, but it talks about here lisinopril tablets. There's an asterisk, a highlight. And if you go down and notice, it says this was made from Printerville tablets from Merck. Uh, you cannot use the same data for an extended BUD if you use a generic. There might be different fillers, different dyes. All of these things do have an impact on stability. So when you see in a USP compound of preparation monograph that they specify a manufacturer, uh, specify a preservative system. So in this case, it was done in Aura Suite and Aura Plus. That comes from Paddock Labs. Unless your suspension and uh, syrup vehicle are identical in ingredient and percentages to the commercial product, and you can demonstrate that, you cannot use the extended BUD that's with, associated with this monograph. It's only tied to uh, this. So USP has done a great job of differentiating when you can use a basic USP chemical versus a specific manufactured product. And this is, these are two pretty good examples that go both directions. And again, uh, in my attempt to highlight, I blobbed out, in this case, the BUD was not more than 90 days. And it then specifies that refrigerated or controlled room temperature. We will get these updated out to you and have them out uh, today once I go in and clean that up. But again, great monographs. You can reference these from a compliance and regulatory standpoint. Um, the beauty of having these and making compound of preparations based on USB monograph is it typically gives you much better BUD dating beyond what's identified in 795 um, and really provides clarity. So for your state boards, uh, helps them understand what they need to do. Strongly encourage any of you on this call, if you've not engaged with your state board, you need to do so. Um, the International Journal of Pharmaceutical Compounding has provided some information for state boards on how to um, essentially, I want to say use an alternate version of 795 and 797-800, but how to adapt these new chapters coming out and how to incorporate them into your state board rules. So I encourage you to uh, look at uh, IJPC's information on uh, these alternates I and mean, absolutely encourage those of you on this call to engage with your state boards and certainly engage with the accrediting bodies so you understand how to write your SOPs, how to uh, set up your work pra workplace practice. Um, that brings us to the end. So I know we've just got a couple minutes here to get in a few questions. I'll open it up for the questions. So Eric, yeah, we have a, a quite a few of them here. I'm going to kind of go through and pull up some of the ones I know we can address quickly so we can get to them as, as prompt and get through as many as possible. Uh, there was a question that came across saying, can a facility do a risk assessment on using hormone creams outside a containment hood? Uh, that's a very popular question comes up. The FAQs do a pretty good job of addressing this. Uh, and I have it pulled up currently and, and not sure exactly if the question is referring to a like a cream concentrate or a hormone concentrate or uh, something they may have made themselves. But question, uh, the FAQ 55 on USB 800's FAQs addresses that specifically regarding concentrated solutions of HDs, hormone concentrates, et cetera. Uh, you can certainly go to the website, review that, but their short and sweet answer is no in regards to that. Uh, that concentrate, cream concentrate, concentrated solutions, et cetera, uh, would not be excluded from USP 800. Again, FAQ 55 specifically addresses the cream concentrate, uh, hormone concentrate question. Yeah, yeah and I would, yeah, sorry, and Eric, just real quickly, I would add, yeah, I would just add, I mean, the conservative wins uh, is that nothing leaves the containment hood, the primary engineering control, until it's in the final form that's going to the patient. There are some provisions if you've got a piece of equipment that doesn't fit inside the hood, then you do a risk assessment on how do you handle it, what's your SOPs for going from the hood to, let's say, a, uh, a convection oven because you're going to bake tr uh, trochies uh, or rapid dissolve tablets. So there's some information there, but you're right, broadly, 
um, until it's in the essentially the ready to dispense to the patient form, it doesn't leave the primary engineering control. And again, uh, Rod's right. Go back to the FAQs and we'll answer it for you. There, there's additional on that as well. I wanted to include uh, FAQ 51 talks about items that, for whatever reason, could not be done within a primary engineering control. The one thing I want to mention specifically about that is there, there are exceptions potentially, but the very last sentence specifically says is, you know, for these scenarios that may be encountered, uh, these are in instances where a CPEC cannot be used. It's not optional. You just don't want to use it. It's where physically it just could not happen within the CPEC. So their stance, again, is, is everything that can happen within the CPEC should happen within the CPEC. Another question, can we treat all powders as a hazardous drug, even if it is not hazardous? Again, um, very good. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Want, no, yeah, go ahead, Ron. There, there, again, the FAQ does a very good job of, of breaking this down of, uh, of your HD, non-HD um, exceptions. Uh, FAQ 29, again, under USP 800, states that separate rooms are required for sterile, non-sterile, HD, and non-HD compounding with two exceptions. I would encourage you to take a look at that. It's, again, it's FAQ 29. Those two exceptions are very, very narrow windows. So for the most part, doing everything in the HD lab and, and working out of that scenario instead of having two separate labs, for, for example, in a non-sterile setting, uh, is not going to be considered acceptable through USP. There are some, as I mentioned, there, there's two exceptions, but they are pretty narrow in scope um, of, of how you can do a non-HD within the HD room. But again, look at it closely. It is very limited in scope. We've probably got time for one, maybe two more questions, and we'll have to wrap. Yeah, and this is going to address the components within the room itself. Uh, are plastic drawers, cabinets uh, not acceptable for not acceptable for USB 800? When it says impervious, does it mean stainless steel only? And and I can kind of expand on that one, Eric. Stainless steel isn't the only option for com you know shelving units, work surfaces within your lab. It is a uh, very good option though, just due to the strength of it and it's being able to support whether it's a hood you're gonna have set on it, easy to clean, it is impervious, it is durable, it's gonna last forever pretty much. Uh, so in compared to, could there be other surfaces, uh, equipment or um, shelving units, et cetera, that, that meet those criteria of being impervious and smooth? There sure absolutely could be. Uh, stainless steel is what we see most folks going with because it's readily available, it is durable, it's easy to clean. It, it, it's just it, it's a good choice for that, but it's not the only choice. So if you have other uh, ideas on how to approach it that are maybe cheaper, again, keep in mind those those key criteria. It has to be impervious, it has to be smooth, free from cracks and crevices, non-shedding. If it meets those criteria, it would be something that that could be used within your hazardous drug room. Well, we're at I uh, show 12:58, or um, I'm Central Time Zone 12:58, so we've got about a minute left. I want to thank everybody for joining us on this. Any questions we didn't get to, we will have a an Excel spreadsheet um, that we'll put together, and generally there are going to be groups of questions that are, that are similar, so we'll make sure we provide answers, and uh, that will come out through ARL after we've had an opportunity to collate them and, and provide answers. Truly appreciate uh, everybody listening in. Please make sure you respond, uh, do the uh, evaluation at the end. Uh, we always want to make sure we can improve and, and uh, make these programs better. It's a continuous quality improvement, CQI. So uh, again, this is the purpose of this was to discuss how you use a USP broadly, and we want you to make sure that you understand this is a great document, uh, but it's cover to cover, not just one chapter. Rod, anything else? Nope. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you all. Have a good day.